Afternoon all. Okay, my seventh round game against Colin Costello, very experienced player, he's about ECF 160, 170 usually for the last like 15 years. Um, I think it's been sometimes over that rating. On fee day is not too high, as as is as, as the case with many um, ECF rated players. It seems, um, well I think a lot of us don't play that many feeler rated games anyway. Um, okay, he played the English opening against me. And I was, I'm thinking everyone's <laughs> pouncing on using C4 against me, like Botvinnik systems, or you know, uh, to torture me. Maybe maybe they don't like my results of the French defence. I look good on chess base or something of the French. I don't know what's going on, but uh, I faced a lot of C4s in this tournament. But in this game, I played uh, F5, which is you know, aiming for the Leningrad Dutch, which I've had very good results statistically. So we both castle here, D6. And he doesn't play d4. He uh, is a bit shy of playing d4. He plays the shy move that I played in the previous round. He's like imitating my play against John Cox, really. Um, that's COX, by the way, yeah, just in case you haven't seen that uh, video. So, uh, expansion on the queen side and um, this, this timid looking d3. But it works out, it seems, uh, during the game, I felt it worked out a lot better for him than, it, than I played against um, John. So, um, Knight c6. Now, what was I thinking with this? I was thinking, okay, I'm giving him a tempo target, but uh, you know, maybe the knight can be usefully uh, rerouted uh, like this. Uh, but maybe this is a mistaken plan. Maybe it's best to just, um, uh, you know, try and play uh, more crudely. You know, just uh, maybe h6, bishop e6, uh, and the old queen d7 plan. f4, bishop h3. Exchange off, uh, trying to mind you, he's going to probably play rook e1 and bishop h3 at some point. But the other alternative was to swing the queen via e8 in this plan, you know, maybe g5 and queen h5. I think I've seen that in one game, that's very interesting as well. With the knight coming to g4, if the bishop goes to h1, then you've got the option of fg sometimes and then rook f3 with, with crude mating threats. So there's a few various, you know, various plans to choose from, but I don't know, knight c6 seems to ring a bell here. To reroute the knight um, when f4 is later played, so, you know, knight e7 to f5. Seems to see that in some master games in the past. So b5, knight e7. Okay, but he's finchettering both bishops. Um, he's using J. Roby's concept of these, you know, finchetted bishops crossing both diagonals. This kind of attack in system we get from from war, you know, attacking from both directions. And it seems uh, very nice here, very pleasant for white. So queen b3, as though c5 might be um, a threat, undermining quickly, or b6. So I play bishop e6. Okay, now rook a1. He's standing, uh, it looks to be a uh, very nice position. I think I've somehow misplayed this. This is the wrong setup, somehow. F4, you know, there's already an infiltration. But the rook can be a potential tactical target, as I discovered in some variations later. Uh, when I played c6, you know, queen b6s, um, uh, maybe some tactical targets. But there was also a more subtle tactical um, implication later, which I totally missed in a critical position. But I, I must say, I was quite exhausted for this game. This was a double round game. My first round that day, you know, getting up uh, to go to get there for 10 o'clock starts, uh, and I'd, I'd missed the win right at the end of that first game. So we used nearly all our time in that first game and a lot of energy. Not much of a break between rounds for the second, you know, round that day. Uh, so this was the, the Monday of, uh, exhaustion. So, um, but anyway, night f5. That's why I thought actually Lennon and Dutch was a good choice because I played it a few times and I thought I could play it a bit routinely and get away with it a little bit. Uh, but knight d5 is forcing me to think, you know, quite a lot about this position. I'm thinking, do I commit with c6? I don't, I don't really want to take on d5. You know, you could recapture, get the c file pressure, get some pressure on c7, maybe b6. It's all sort of pressure on my pawn structure, which I could do without. But um, the way I played it didn't seem that good uh, during the game, especially. So he took on f6, and now queen a3. Maybe he sensed there's some tactical liability lines uh, taking and uh, queen b6, maybe knight g frees. But uh, there's a big problem, you know, which I was showing him in post mortem. Well, it seemed to me with this whole idea, um, which maybe means I shouldn't have really destroyed my chain with fg. Maybe I should have kept the tension there with g5. So maybe to play g4, maybe f3 later. 
So I, I resolved some tension and it left me with a very shaky pawn structure here, the, these two guys. Uh, so I'm not sure FG is any good strategically. Um, it's playing for a bit of a cheapo um, with like uh, knight g3 and queen b6 ideas or just queen b6 and knight g3. Um, the thing is this this doesn't really work. If um, I played c takes b5 here with with the idea that if if takes then yeah you know qu queen b6 and I, I'm hitting the rook and, and threatening knight g3. But he's got lots of alternatives here. Um, you know, maybe even a pawn set with d4, or just, I don't know, e3. Because look at this structure, it's a bit broken and it's a bit fragmented here. Island, island, island. Three pawn islands. Doesn't look good. I think white's got a lot of trump cards. Okay, I'm attacking the b5 pawn, but it's not really a big deal. Um, if he loses that, surely. Or maybe it is. <laughs> I, don't know. Uh, I don't really want to stick on an engine here. But what what I did do is um, so this did happen. So C takes B five. He actually though uh, he he's sacked a pawn. So C five. So he's really exposing this E five pawn. And I felt really uncomfortable in this position. However, I failed to notice maybe for exhaustion not being thorough again in critical positions. That there's a very good resource here, um, based. Um, I'll give you a clue based on this rook, and I wonder if you can spot it if I gave you ten seconds, uh, starting from now. Okay, according to Crafty, I'm on a particularly a laptop which hasn't got that many engines installed, but um, Crafty, I'm, I think it might have a point though. Ninety-seven, it might need to be checked by other ranges, but. The crafty's point of being crafty <laughs> is knight c6 to attack the rook because the rook's actually not got too many squares. The pawn's actually on a4. Now, this critical position business is starting to intrigue me because it's easier said than done. You know, the position doesn't go red or something to say this is critical, spend more time here because, you know, either there's a win or there's a loss coming your way depending on your move here. You know, the position isn't saying critical or an alert level. So how do you work out if it's a critical position? Well, the thing is something dramatic has just happened. You know, he has actually just sacked <clears throat> a pawn. And I think this creates some an element of incalcul incalculability when incalculability when a human plays it when a human plays a pawn sack. We really don't know the implications. It's really a dramatic change of everything going on in, in the position. Uh, you, you know, not this routine uh, recapture. For example, you know, the, the pawn on b5, you know, it's usefully attacking now a4. So this is the point that um, something unexpected happens or the opponent plays a move a bit quickly and it looks dynamic but interesting. A lot of emotions then come in onto the scene when in fact this is the time you could be a research scientist and look, hang on, this is a critical position maybe. Um, not because of anything I've particularly seen in the position. Okay, we've got a loose sort of rook, which has been a tactical target on that diagonal. So, okay, there's, there could be natural questions like, you know, how can this rook be a, a tactical target in other ways? But I guess you can also detect, sniff out a position as critical from the speed of the opponent and how dynamic their last moves be. And, you know, you're not playing computer, you know, so if they've done this pawn sack, it's going to be incalculable. So maybe this is the time when Kotov's um, candidate move theory really kicks in. And maybe that's one thing I've completely underestimated about Kotov. That, um, you know, the fact is it would be completely exhausting to look at candidate moves at each and every turn. So I think the idea is if you did sniff that the position was critical, and obviously not by analysis, because that would defeat the whole object, you'd be totally exhausted by the end of the game if you had to do lots of analysis on each turn. But if you got an intuitive sense, maybe of an opponent playing a move quickly, riskily, or a pawn sack, it's here that, may, you know, maybe, you know, candidate move theory to establish candidate moves, you know, it would have helped me identify knight e7, which although it seems from one end, you know, strategically, you know, the knight was on d4, the whole point was, you know, to attack here. But actually, in this position, knight e7 threatens, you know, a temporary pawn set on d6 to threaten knight c6. So candidate move theory might have been very helpful. 
but the intuitive sniff, if this position is critical or not, comes from other factors, you know, what the opponent's last down, you know, is is it emerging like chaos on the board? Um, but even then, you know, intuition plays a big role. So I I just find chess very complicated. And I'm just waffling on here. Please feel free to comment on, on this waffle. But um, I miss knight e7. Crafty's saying it's a good move. I, I have no idea if actually there's something deeper and it's not a good move without checking on a more powerful engine. But it looks good to me, knight e7. Uh, if, if we follow it through with one variation. So say C takes D6. So he's done damage to E5, which was his strategic intent. But there's a tactical rebounding of the idea because of that pawn on B5 stopping the rook from coming back and the queen also stopping the rook from coming back. What what is he what would he be doing here? This is this is tricky. Now let's let's look at another line. So say knight uh, you know knight whoops knight d two so you know to to play bishop c six that seems a bit desperate. You don't want to give up the light square bishop in a hurry. Uh, okay, say so takes on d6, then b4. Black looks fantastic here, uh, you know, in this in this kind of position. As long as white hasn't got those two pointy bishops across the center, that's great. That's great news, especially you know the light square weakness bonuses of, of white losing that Finchetto bishop over there. So anyway, as my excuse is, I was I was quite tired and and maybe you know I I need to develop this this critical. Um, critical position theory maybe a few videos on that how do we sniff intuitively intuitively what the critical positions are where you know you should spend time here because you're either going to be damaged or do permanent damage to the position so anyway so bishop e7 he plays actually it's so it's it's not a particularly good move i think so queen a1 i think he's better um thankfully there's also football on apparently um so after d takes c5 knight takes e5 i thought i've got to rob these bishops because i don't really want to be mated you know with a knight there and queen there it wouldn't be a particularly pleasant end to the day so i thought okay i'd rather lose g6 instead and maybe get this potential for i don't know something going on with rook f7 so i want to get rid of white's bishop pair so knight d4 so hitting e2 and with this move i know it's really complicated now well, I hope it is anyway. But no, we found some resources for both sides here. Um, in post mortem, I offer the draw, and after some consideration, it was accepted to my great relief because I was actually <laughs> completely shattered by this stage that day. The double round, you know, getting up super early to get the train, you know, to get there for ten for that first game, then that exhaustingly long first game. Um, I don't know. I was just relieved to get a draw here, but this. So this is how it is. This is the story how it is. But let's have a look. Knight, knight takes g6. So say rook f4. Say knight f4. That's kind of critical. Whoops. No, no. He wants to take on d4 first. Obviously, he doesn't want to allow knight takes e2. Forget knight g6. So bishop takes d4 first. Knight takes g6. So rook f7. Now say knight f4 here. We were looking at an exchange sack idea, and maybe here now um, queen d7. So the cheeky idea is is just try and use that g file. Now maybe that would have been significant in practice, because uh, also I've got this running past pawn maybe in a b4. So maybe there's some compensation for the exchange. The key factor here is probably easier to play now, becoming easier to play for black because white hasn't got those raking bishops the g file is going to be a bit of a pain hopefully to defend um, but as I say I was I was completely a bit fed up a bit exhausted and I thought my position was worse subjectively so this that's why the, the draw offer here uh, thankfully it was accepted so let's have a look in overview and summary um, so again, I mean, I think that's 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 the le the big lesson for me so far. When I'm looking, you know, as a generalization of this tournament, is is this notion of of being able to spend longer on the critical positions. Uh, but the the, the catch twenty two of that, how do you know a position is critical? I think you've got to pick up some a lot of different vibes actually. Not not just through calculation to establish that because that would be exhausting, and and then you you. You defeat the point. You'd be spending the same time on every move to work out if something's critical. So that question, 
um, of criticality is critical. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, so bishop e7, and um, it's just, I don't know, knight d4. It's how it is. I offer the, it was a grandmaster draw off. <laughs> you know, just totally exhausted though that day. It was a double round day. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.